hello everyone. I hope you are all well. I'm Brian Howells from FIH. I'm very pleased to see you today for this online gender equality workshop organized by the Pan American Hockey Federation and the FIH. So just to facilitate the interaction during the meeting, as Andre just told us, but I kindly ask you to put your device on mute. And to ask you questions, please use the meeting chat, which is available on your own screen. We will then do our best to interact in live with you. You will also find the email address of my colleague Valerie Arena on this chat, on this chat sorry, so you can send her an email at the end of the webinar if you still have any questions. She will be happy to get back to you. So please feel free to use those different paths. Um, as you know, the gender equality program is hugely important for the FIH, and it is absolutely great to see you all today for this meeting. Thank you very much to you all, and especially to Mary and Laura, who have set up this call. Thanks to her. Okay. Thank you very much, Andre. Very impressing what you are explaining, and some of the words I understand, fortunately. <laughs> Good evening to all of you. A very special evening. Re reminded in your mind forever. It's today the 24th of February 2021 and it's the first time we have a continental webinar about gender equality. Equalidad de género. And I, as a, a chairman of the FIH Women in Sports Committee, I'm very proud I can say a few words to you. You will, be a, you will have a lovely evening tonight because you will talk about one of the most important parts of gender equality, and that's women in coaches. Women coaches, you can see in grassroots and at top elite level, are not a lot. So it's important we get more. And tonight is the, the start of the travel, the journey in Pan Am to get more women coaches involved. Maybe you all know that the slogan for FIH is that we are equally amazing. And that's, of, of course, a fantastic slogan. But we have to feel that understanding. It's not only to have words. And that's what we're going to start to do tonight. You have also two representatives in your continent for the Women in Sport Committee. All the others have one, but because Pan Am is such so important, you have two. And this is Philip Fernandez from uh, British Guinea, and it's uh, Scott Pepper from Canada. And he is also the athlete's representative. Tonight, as I said already, we will start with the Continental Webinars. That is one of the commitments of our committee that is set out in the gender equality policy. I give now the word to Mary, and I wish you all a fantastic evening. Or morning, afternoon, whatever the time is in your country. Have a good yes. day. Thank Bye. you, Marika. Uh, for me, it's mid-afternoon, so I welcome you to a mid-afternoon in Toronto. No snow today, so that's all good for us. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for participating, and especially our panelists, and a special thank you to Sarah Juggins, who's going to be your moderator. When we were asked for by Marika to be the first Continental Federation to present on gender equity, the first piece that came up was women in coaching. We know it's a broad topic. We are not going to solve all the issues this afternoon, but we do hope that it starts to stimulate some discussion. Maybe you'll learn a piece of information that you can take back to your own associations and we can move from there. So on behalf of PAF and our president, Coco Budeski, thank you very much. And let's enjoy this hour and a half of hopefully stimulating conversations. And I do remind you, if you do have a question, please to put it into the chat room so that we can make sure that the panelists have an opportunity to have that discussion. Thank you and over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Mary. Well, welcome to everybody. I think one of the most exciting things about this uh, about this first webinar in the series uh, looking at uh, looking at gender equality is the fact that we've got 28 national associations represented here today uh, from the PAF uh, from the PAF area, um, and also some guests from the other continents. So we've got people from all five continents who've joined this this uh, this conversation and who will be starting PAF on their journey. 
uh, towards discussing, improving and developing equality within the continent. Um, I'm delighted uh, with the panel that we've got tonight. Uh, sorry, <laughs> this afternoon for you guys, this evening for me, the morning for somebody else um, on the call. But I'm, I'm just so um, pleased that we've got such a wide ranging experienced uh, group of panelists. So I'll just quickly introduce each of each of them. We've got Argentina's um, Laura de Cole, uh, a goalkeeper who you'll all know, an Olympic silver medalist with Las Leonas, and now a successful and very well known coach and coach educator in her own right. So uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, hola, Laura. And Laura's just Thanks there. Very much. Um, we've also got Anthony Meccano, who coaches both internationally um, as an FIH educator and also within his own home country of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Anthony's actually cruising around in his car at the moment. So, hi, Anthony, how are you? Thanks, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's good. I, I think it's very cool. Uh, we have Camilla Karam of, um, of Chile. Uh, she's one of the stalwarts of uh, the Diablos um, and has been behind their rise up the world rankings. She's got an incredible 238 caps for her country, and she's actually been a captain for Chile since 2013. Um, this today is the first time that I've met Camilla face to face, as it were, on Zoom. But I've actually been in conversation with her lots in the past few years, because if you need a comment about hockey in Chile, then Camilla is, a, is an absolutely great person to talk to. Uh, so we're absolutely delighted to have her on the, uh, on the call today. Uh, so hola, Camilla. Hi, Sarah. Nice to put a face in your name also. So exactly. happy to be here. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and finally, we've got Craig Parnham, um, an Olympian himself who played for Great Britain before moving into coaching. He helped coach Great Britain to a bronze um, at the London 2012 Olympics uh, before becoming first head coach and then director of coaching for USA Field Hockey. Um, he's someone who, who I, I know relatively well, and he's someone who I think that uh, USA Field Hockey are incredibly lucky to have on their books. So uh, welcome, Craig. Hey, thank you. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, I'll just explain how we're going to run this session. Um, I want all the panellists to have um, equal chance to discuss and talk about what's going on in their country, because all of you, far more than me, will appreciate that across the PAF region, there are just so many variations um, in the way that hockey is provided, in the way that hockey is coached, um, and, and in the level of hockey uh, that's being, that's being uh, played. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk to each of the panellists in turn about each of the, uh, across six, um, six areas. And I'm going to start off really by asking each of the panellists to just give a, a, a relatively brief assessment of the current coaching situation in their own country. So talking about things like um, how many female coaches there are, what level of coaching those female coaches are working at within their, within their association, uh, whether there are role models that people can look up to um, and, and see that there are these pathways. So um, I think uh, probably we'll, we'll start with Craig. Craig, if, if you could just talk to us um, a little bit about the situation uh, in the USA at the moment. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, we, we're, as many people will know, um, field hockey in the USA is, is a predominantly it's a, a female based sport. And so we have we tip the tables the other way in terms of participation for women in coaching. We, we have huge numbers um, of female representation at, throughout the pathway from grassroots right the way through to high performance. And as many people well know, the, the, Nash, the um, NCAA, the uh, college system is, is home to where a lot of the players play. And there's a huge amount of female coaches in that um, sphere. Uh, I think we've got 200, just, just short of 280 um, college programs that are going on. Um, and of that, it's a huge percentage of female head coaches, which is great to see. Um, and that that kind of puts us slightly as an, as an anomaly, really, for the, for the conversation we're having tonight. But um, that, that's driven by our domestic situation and that the NCAA um, female hockey is in the college system, male hockey is not. And, and so um, there's been a rich history of development and pathway for, for female coaches, which we are very proud of and we continue to support uh, as, as much as we can. But um, yeah, I mean, it's very unusual. I think about 80, 85 percent of female coaches and Division One programs are, are, are female head coaches. It's, it's even higher in D2 and D3. 
and, and many of our club owners um, are are female owned, up and owned and operated. So um, we we. We, we know we're a little bit of an outlier in terms of the rest of the population. As Marika was saying at the start, that very few across the globe are filling the high, high performance roles in, in coaching. So um, we're, we're, we're able to provide programming across, as I said, grassroots right away through to high performance. And in the question, the second part of the question about role models, I, I think we're incredibly lucky here in the US. We have some outstanding role models um, for our female players and, and for our coaches and our, our pathway often has traditionally been that players come out of the you know to come out of the playing area at the high performance level and they find their way into coaching and that's been a uh, almost a tradition that we've seen through um, through US women's hockey for many many years and that has meant that there's a there's a, a huge amount of experience in the pathway and we can look to anchor onto some of these you know extraordinary um knowledgeable uh, coaches that we have and, and we always look to do that and the pathway continues former players that were playing in the team that i was coaching just a few years ago they're embedded in our junior high performance programs now they're great role models and they can really help you know um, education up the pathway to the coaches and then sort of down the pathway to the players so in that respect we're, we're very lucky I, I'm, sh- I'm sure of that yeah and th- thank you Craig for that that's a, that's a great summation of the situation um, and as you say I think the rest of the world looks at the USA and, and sees that anomaly you know the fact that you you have got a strong female section um, you, they, they, they don't travel out of the country much though do they your female coaches I'm trying to think of some examples they do tend to stick within that college system um, so may, maybe that's something that we can we can talk about a bit later. Um, yes. But I'll, yeah, I'll let I'll let you have a have a break from from chatting now and uh, go over to Laura. If you could just talk to us, Laura, about the situation in Argentina. Yes. Uh, hi, Sarah. Uh, uh, first, uh, thanks uh, everyone. Uh, in Argentina, the ninety uh, percent of uh, coaches of first divisions uh, are men. And here, uh, our first sport in women's, in uh, girls, is hockey. So it's a really a, a very different situation between the players and then the players that become or want to be coaches. Uh, in um, under uh, very kids, under eight, under six, under ten, there are a lot of uh, female coaches. But uh, in the first division level, uh, 90 or 95 percent are uh, men. Yeah, that's that's a very sort of common situation, isn't it? Where you find female coaches working in the lower age groups and the lower, if you like, ability groups. Um, and yet as, as you move further up the ladder, and again, that's something that we, we can perhaps talk about later, because I think that's uh, that's something that a lot of nations can really appreciate and really think about about changing. Um, OK, uh, Camilla, um, Chile, I'm, I'm guessing that's a sort of slightly similar situation to Argentina, yes? Uh, yes, actually it is. I think the percentage is pretty much similar in, in the first, in the top league. Uh, but when you go to um, lower divisions, you definitely have much more uh, women coaches. Uh, but I think it's the um, it's a time uh, that it, it needs to the demand that a, a, a coaching needs. It's it's what's difficult for women to be in in the top leagues or even in in national leagues in national um, uh, teams. So that that I think is a it's a hard time here in Chile. We don't consider, or there are not many women that consider it um, their first option to be a career, to make a career out of uh, training. So that's what we're trying to change uh, nowadays. Thank you, thank you. Yes, and and again, we'll we'll come back to that that point and and discuss it a little bit further. Um, Anthony, uh, you out of your car now? Yes, I am. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> So Trinidad and Tobago, I, I, I've got to confess, I know very little about the coaching setup in in your country. What, what you know, where are you with female coaches? Yeah, I think for us, um, you know, our league isn't all that strong, and where female coaches come into play, um, tend not to be that strong. We more have it in our educational system, where we have the coaches doing that developmental side for us, and there is more of a mix between female and male in that area. Um, but when it comes to the international level, um, very few women um, qualified or um, certified. I know that 
I have I have made it my assistant coach to be female, and I've tried to push her through doing courses, etc., with the FIH and getting her involved um, at the high level. And because of that, she now actually coaches a first division men's team in um, in our country. So you know that gave her the confidence to do that. But where there's that opportunity, I think for females themselves, they don't see it as rightfully as as Camilla is saying as an opportunity or to want to do that as a job. Um, and I suppose the opportunities are not there for them, except through the ministry, as the same, our ministry of sport um, allows that developmental side of it. And they would work there on the developmental side in the school system. Thank you. So I, I think what we can probably um, gather from that conversation is that, um, in three of our, nation, our national associations, and this will be very true across, I would imagine, um, the, 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 the continent and, and other continents as well. Um, we have this situation where, yes, um, females go into coaching at the lower levels, they go into coaching at the younger age groups, uh, but once it starts to become um, more a career, once it starts to become something that perhaps um, calls for more time, we start to see that dropout rate. Um, Laura, you're someone who has bucked the trend in that respect, in that you're a you, you know you're a top coach, your your work it's it's your it's your career as well. Um, what are your thoughts on that? What what are your what are your thoughts on why females don't necessarily see coaching as a career? Is it is it a tradition or is it a lack of as we spoke about role models or is it a lack of opportunities or is it the time that's required? What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, today with the seeing six months uh, old baby, I can continue working in my, for example, in my goalkeeping academy in the university from the first months of her birth, thanks to my family organization. It is uh, difficult in Argentina to organize when mothers uh, have three months of license when the baby born and fathers uh, three days. Uh, there should be a law uh, to, equa to equal this, the, the situation. Uh, an example uh, could be the, I don't know, Scandinavian countries, they have uh, one year of license and they can divide uh, six months the father, six months the, the mother or the parents, yes, uh, at least three months, uh, each one with the baby. I think this is uh, uh, the, the difficult part of organization in a family when you don't have any help or, I don't know, or you don't have the, the, the money to pay a nursing. Sure, I can see that's really difficult. Um, and um, Camilla, as well, is it, it, it sort of, is it the case that um, coaching courses and also the intensity of the job itself aren't necessarily suited to somebody who's also got family commitments you know and I'm thinking for example if you do a um, a coaching course quite often it's over a week a, a whole weekend um, if you're a national team coach you could be away for three weeks four weeks even longer so I'll, is that one of the factors that might come into females not coming into coaching at, at a higher level mm, I'm not sure that the um, the courses are are the are the trouble there I think it's something similar to, to what uh, Laura said. Um, here, the society is, um, well, it doesn't doesn't help very much in, uh, the mothers to get a career in, in anything. I mean, you really have to be uh, passionate about what you like. And if, if here in Chile, if somebody would want to be um, a hockey trainer, they, they will be able to do it. I think we have a lack of also role models. There aren't that many um female coaches uh, now at the top league so it's hard to say okay maybe i'll do it because she's done it there's has, has to be somebody that does it first which we have now i think for the next generations it will they will have role models uh but i'm not sure the the coaching courses are the problem here in chile not really no, just a question to you then, Anthony, because I mean, you, you, you run quite a lot of courses. Do you, when you are designing or, or um, scheduling a course, do you, do you think around things like family commitments and, and the sort of the time that you're asking people to, to give to, the, to those, those courses and that learning? Yeah, I think that's a, a key thing, especially, um, you know, one of our taglines down here is the future is female. And um, due to that, just that simple tagline, we try to get as much involvement as possible and therefore take that feedback in designing anything that we decide to design. Um, understanding that motherhood um, role that is played 
um, but still also given the opportunity to whether um, create a facility where we could assist in that manner while they attend the courses. Um, so that's something that we look at very strongly um, in that essence. But we do recognize um, that that female, that, that woman uh, intuition with the, with the children and the home and by itself, as we look at things, you know, um, that's something that we always have a challenge with. Um, and we try our best to see how many, um, we can balance off females to males in the courses that we make sure that we kind of touch on the same, um, you know, population sector. Sure. Um, thank you for that. Um, and Craig, what do you think um, other nations can learn about the way that the coaching pathway is structured in the USA to allow women to progress up that career and at the same time run, you know, raise and run a family? Yeah, I, I can certainly talk to the first point. The second point about how you can successfully run your family is probably not my area of expertise. But um, <laughs> just, I mean, certainly on the first point about coaching programs and coach education, as I said, we are very mindful of the whole pathway of coaching from grassroots through to elite. And, you know, when we're running coach education, we're, we're actually we're thinking about the program and, and the timing of a program and the length of a day. Um, but that's not specifically related to, you know, allowing attendees to attend, because as we've said before, that 90 percent when I go and run a coaching course, it is it is it's dominated by a female population. And the, the, the rarity is getting the male coach there. So it's as it is the exact flip for us. Um, women over here and, and because there's so many career opportunities within schools or colleges or wherever it may be, they have. You know, as, as anybody does, they have to find time and, and schedule their days. And we had an example with a national team coach who was a, a great friend of mine and a former player who took on the national team in the interim period just a um, few, few months ago, last year before. And, and I was, I'd, I'd just got a young child herself. And so there is, as Camilla was saying, huge stresses in the job, but it is um, it is possible. It's it takes obviously a lot of organisation and, uh, and planning, but the support network that our coaches have here. I mean, I, I don't I can't speak for individual situations, but it, it obviously is working because we we are able to you know have coaches, female coaches in in, in pathway positions, grassroots through to elite. Um, so it's certainly. It is possible. Um, our coach education, we've learned a lesson like many people have in the last 12 months that we're shifting a lot of our education opportunities to online and virtual. And that is really helping us. It means that I mean, our biggest event is National Coaches Forum. It's an annual event. Um, and we had three times the number of people at our virtual forum, the first time we've ever done it this year. It allows people to join in live like people are now or yep. they can watch a recording later on in their own time. And so that's really, really helpful for us. We're, we're lessons for us. And if other nations are thinking about the same thing as well, we're now really trying to, you know, find the really best way of connecting with coaches virtually in terms of video review. So coaches can send us video. We can assess their performance and give them feedback via video. We're, we're working on getting that as robust and, and as good as we can, but that's probably the next thing for us, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I think that is such a great point. And it's, if, if anything positive has come out of the, the whole pandemic, it's the fact that it's pushed that online learning forwards probably by three or four years, if not more. Now, Laura, um, I, I know um, that you have taken a lot of your courses on, or you, you took quite a lot of your courses online. What was the reaction to that? Did, did you find it a, a big success? Uh, yes, uh, my experience as uh, educator of the AFIH Academy and the Pan American Hockey Federation is really very positive because it gives it give me the opportunity to share in knowledge with male and female coaches from all over the world, uh, always with equal relationship. And uh, because of the pandemic, a lot of uh, coaches, for example, from Argentina, that I know from my city, uh, could uh, access to these courses and they are very very happy because uh, here we don't have a lot of online uh, coaching courses yeah and the same for you Anthony I mean it, it must also cut down on travel time for people it must make um, your, your coaching courses more accessible across the, the entire continent um, I mean that, that is a good thing but I, I guess the flip side is you do also need that face-to-face -face contact 
Yeah, I think uh, you're making a very valid point there. We do as coaches, you know, as coaches, we always want to have that contact and you know, to get that feedback and that that sort of aura around us. Um, but yeah, it has created a situation where um, the online learning has definitely benefited. And I, I would kind of piggyback on Craig that we have had numerous improvement in our numbers attendance based on that online um, learning. You know, um, it also gives, I mean, you, you, you find people and, and even more females now could attend, even if they are seen about the household or they are seen with the children, they could still be online and still be taking in what is happening and give them the opportunity to that instead of having to, yeah, jump in a car and travel to a certain situation or a certain location to be able to take the same course. So I think we um, generally, you know, I always take hats off the path on the FIH for actually jumping on board so quickly and having things online for everyone to be a part of and to see that um, improvement. I can say on my end, there are a lot of people now that have been doing a lot of the course, um, courses online um, and therefore getting more involvement with female um, coaches to actually participate in things when we send it out now. So it's more yeah. accessible. So yeah. Cool. Um, it's, I've just come very, very slightly off track here, but one of the things that really interests me, and perhaps, I mean, Camilla, from a player's point of view as well, um, but all feel free all to dive in. Have you have you discovered that with online coaching courses, you're able to explore areas of coaching that perhaps you wouldn't have time for if it was just the on pitch stuff? And I'm sort of talking about things like um, working on a team's culture or working on um, team's behaviours and things like that. Things that when when you're on the pitch and you've physically got a hockey stick and a hockey ball and people running around, you perhaps don't even have 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 the motivation or the time to do that. But so, Camilla, I'll come to you first. Have you found that your team through online discussions have actually changed in cultural outlook a little bit, maybe? Um, yes, definitely. And especially us, we have a coach that likes to talk a lot and <laughs> create this create this um, team culture. Um, so he had lots of time this year to to create it uh, throughout all the all the discussions that we have. And I think it was a good opportunity that sometimes in the pitch when you have two hours only just to play hockey and you have to play for the for the pitch also, you can't take the time there. So um, we, we realized that those moments are as important sometimes as uh, as the training as uh, training in the field. So we um, we were able to to uh, to take that time and and improve in other parts of the of the team. Fantastic. Um, and Craig, um, Craig, you're nodding quite a lot there. Is that that's a point that you obviously agree with? Yeah, definitely. I think um, you know the flexibility of coaches and players over the past. 12 months has been critical and, um, you know, st stumbling around at the start to try and figure it all out. But um, yeah, I think the opportunity to develop different areas has been presented to a lot of coaches and players. And um, that that that's interesting to see. It's interesting to see the pro league start up again and see how teams were moving around the field. And I think we've seen it from another a lot of other sports about the increased injury rate after a you know a layoff like this and coming back from going from zero to a hundred, and so I think you know, we're very mindful of that as well, and we all should be as coaches and leaders about particularly youth players when they've not been doing as much maybe, and then they're coming back and they've been asked to play in multiple games back to back. I think that's an important consideration for us to, to be aware of. But um, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity on the online and whether it's developing culture, tactical acuity, whatever it is, but um, yeah, huge opportunities. Yeah, I think so we, we can probably sum this, this part of the discussion up by saying um, that people who are thinking about uh, changing the way that they offer their coaching should think about a blended approach, a blended approach of online and the actual on the field coaching and that will inevitably open up accessibility not just not just bringing more women into it but actually bringing people from outlying parts of the country outlying parts of the continent and, and making things more accessible which brings me on nicely um, and I didn't even plan it uh, to part two which is identifying opportunities for um, coaching so again if we can just go around um, nation by nation and you just give me a little bit of an overview of sort of the courses that are available to coaches in your country um, whether there's funding available for, uh, to, to support people uh, what courses are available and how accessible they are um, so um, let's Let's, let's hit Anthony first with that question. Yeah, well, besides the, the Panam and the FIH courses, locally we have um, courses that we do we do carry out. Um, for coaches, we try to do generic and not specific sometimes. 
and then we actually go into it. Where funding is concerned, we tend to look a lot at the Olympic Solidarity as well to help us with those um, with those courses and to be able to have them um, available for everyone. Uh, but yeah, that, that would be our course. If we have a level one and a level two um, for our local coach as well, which we tend to, um, level one's definitely all, the, um, all the coaches in the schooling system has to have that to actually be able to present um, the sport to the athletes. And then if you are interested to move on to a level two and therefore get into the club structures and stuff like that, then you can actually attend that level two course. Unfortunately, those are not funded and therefore you would have to find, um, you know, funds to be able to take part in it in that mm -hmm. manner. But there are some courses like, um, there are some courses where we do have funds for it and therefore we just need attendance to actually get that qualification in it to be able to be part of the, um, the program. Uh, so how, how often would a level two course run in your in your country? Would you have one annually or as as and when there are enough people or how, how often would that? Then we tend to look at first the level ones and therefore look at the time frame of the level ones having the opportunity to actually be practical and get things done and then offering that level two for those who would like to move on uh, monitoring and evaluations on the level one coaches to make sure that following things that we were taught and then actually having that level two for people to attend so we tend to kind of build up on the level ones and therefore have the level two with the transition of the level ones after a certain period of time that they have been experienced the user utilizing the skills and tools that they were given at the level one and then therefore having the opportunity to get to the level two at that point Cool. Do you also work with um, some of the other uh, Caribbean nations as well? You know, do you have sort of joint partnerships and things? Yeah, not really. What we did, um, we actually tried to host a, we hosted actually, not tried through the pandemic, we hosted a course for the Caribbean where we had some, uh, some of them involved in it, whether it be Jamaica, Barbados, you know, getting involved in us doing certain topics and stuff. And again, this is where the platform of online came very useful to us normally that wouldn't happen uh, yeah you know if, if it is that the pan am is having a course in a certain country then we will all get there to be able to take part in it but actually this online now where we could share ideas within ourselves and do our levels not necessarily a level one or level two um but just to share <laughs> topics and ideas is important for us uh, yeah. over the pandemic so that was, a, that was really interesting. Brilliant. Um, Camilla, same sort of thing um, in, in, in Chile. You know, what, what are the opportunities for coaching? What are the courses that are available? This is a little unfair because you're a player at the moment, uh, not necessarily a coach, but I, I know you've done some homework on this. <laughs> yeah. yes, I, yes, I have. I've been asking around a little bit, but um, there are uh, several co uh, coaching courses in, in Chile and they're all at least level one uh, for yeah. free. So we're trying like to to level up all the coaches in Chile because I think before we didn't used to have that many courses, um, but now last year as we did it also online we had many many uh, people interested, uh, much more than than before. Of course, it's much easier this way. Um, so so I think those at least those level one courses are all for free uh, the, the federation offers it for free so that everybody can level up um, but then the next ones um I think you would have to pay I'm not really yeah. sure amounts and everything and um, and there is a, I think the if anybody's interested in in doing international courses I think the federation is is um, wanting to help also and there is some funding for that Fantastic. So, so actually, the situation is level one, and I'm presuming um, that sort of teachers as well as coaches, is it? So that you get, you know, hockey that's being taught in schools is also being taught to a certain standard, possibly. Sort of, yeah. Sort of, maybe yeah. not so much. <laughs> and and then level two, that would really be a coach taking it upon um, herself in this case to um, improve her own professional development. But then the 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 national association then steps in to help push to the next level. That's that's the situation with with you guys. Yes, because there are, I'm I'm not really sure because I don't know all the whole situation. But I think there aren't that many people interested in in going into the international courses in Chile. Actually, in Chile we don't have that many high level coaches. We yeah. have a lot of Argentinian coaches that come here to Chile because there is a lack of um, high level coaches in Chile. Yeah, great. Thank you. OK, Laura, same to you. Um, opportunities in, in Argentina. Um, obviously, you can go across to Chile and do lots of coaching, as we've just heard. 
<laughs> yes, sure. Uh, here in Argentina, in the Argentina Federation, uh, you have uh, online uh, courses. Uh, all of them are paid, so you have to pay to access to them. They are uh, not face-to-face uh, -face, uh, coaching courses. I think this is uh, could be a, a possibility to make face-to-face -face, face -face coaching courses. And there are uh, private private uh, coaching courses for, from, for example, I don't know, uh, head coaches that uh, made a webinar, workshop, and you can pay and be there. So we don't have any anything free. <laughs> there are always uh, the AFIH Academy and Pan American coaching courses since next year that you can access uh, to them. But we don't have free education in Argentina from hockey coaching course. Okay, I'll come back to that in a minute because I'll just ask for Craig's input on the same topic and then we'll, we'll come back to the point that you've just made there, Laura. Craig. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have uh, a variety of opportunities for coaches. Um, we have sort of foundations courses that um, we try and that they're free to access. And then our, our formal, if you like for a bit of a term, so level ones, level twos, our formal education, there is a, there, that's, there's a fee for that. But that we, we, we feel that's, you know, pretty extensive and it's um, well researched and it's good, good content. Um, I think where we're, you know, that's been my focus for the first few years of this role. And then the next bit for us is to formalize our more elite coach program. So a level three to really flesh out a level three and, and get that up and running. Um, but we, we are able to help sort of some of our informal elite coaches with different opportunities. And we might take them to the, you know, U.S. Marine Training Corp and just go through some leadership stuff and things like that. And we're able to do some some kind of we got connections so we, we try and leverage on that as much as we can but we, we I think uh, like Anthony was talking about there we have this sort of we have the formal and then we have the more informal which I think is quite common now with sort of the online stuff and so one of the things that's been really cool for us is uh, since the pandemic started we had we have sort of coaches coffee chats every week and so we just had our 47th version of that and, and it's just an informal space for people to call in like this and, and just to talk about various different topics or um, initiatives in coaching and that's been useful for us and a bit old-fashioned but we kind of we have a book club as well where we just sort of pick some coaching books and, and invite coaches to join that and that again has been a little bit old school but it's been a really in, a, a informal uh, informative way to connect with colleagues with coaches and I think there's those that have participated in that have, have found great value in it but um, yeah so we, we, we have that real blend of online and in person but I think it's been interesting for me as an educator to see a lot of coaches now um, diving into online learning over the past 12 months and I think it's fantastic absolutely brilliant and that's as Camilla was saying that's one of the things you can't normally do in a time yeah. when you're working because you don't have that opportunity but I think we can't forget that coaching is a people business and you have to have the in-person thing. And as you spoke about, the blended approach is absolutely paramount. And good as this is, this is not the same as looking somebody in the eye and having a conversation as, as we need to when we're coaching. So we're working hard on trying to make any online experience as good as we can. But also remember, we, we have to do the in-person. It's so important for our industry. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and uh, again, that's something that we'll, we'll come back to at the end. The, the, the sort of creation of a, a coaching community is so important to support people. And where there might be a lack of um, role models possibly to look up to, if you've got peers who are all pushing for the same thing, that in its own self is a, is a very supportive mechanism. But as I say, we'll, we'll, we'll just discuss that a bit more at the end. Um, two, two points have sort of, um, I think, sprung out there a little bit for me. Um, the first one, it's a question for all of you. Do do you think that when coaches have to pay for their own learning, they're more likely to see it as a career um, and you're more likely to get the, um, the, the sort of, I don't know, the, the, the professional approach which will lead to people sorting out their childcare, sorting out their, 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 their timing and their scheduling? Uh, is, is it actually in some ways a good thing to get people paying for their courses? Um, and we'll come to Camilla first. Mm. Well, I think it. I think it is important that people pay for it because then you you really appreciate what you're what you're getting the the um, 
the knowledge that you're getting, you're really appreciating it. But in in our situation here in Chile, I think as we don't have that many coaches, um, it's a good approach, I think, from the federation to level up all the uh, in level one all the coaches and offer it for free. It's something that's that's very good for us because the uh, the hockey also is growing very fast here in Chile. Yeah. Um, so we have many many little uh, clubs or little teams that are starting, and their coaches they they don't know much about hockey because they are football players and that they saw an opportunity in hockey um, because it's growing a lot. So um, in that case, um, I think in Chile it's been doing it's been right this way. Yeah. But uh, I find that it's important also to 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 pay for your for your career for your knowledge that you want to keep on learning, because it's what in any other career you would do, in the end. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's it's I, I guess that is the the approach that we take in the in in the UK as well. You know, people go in at one level and they get a lot of support because they're needed at that mass level, and then if they want to take it further, the onus is then on them. Um, and and you, you were saying the same, Anthony, as well. You know, they're sort of slightly more informal at the at the lower end of of coaching, and then you just move up through those uh, through that ladder, if you like. Yeah. yeah, we have to do it that way. Yeah, so that I mean, we always say that you know people don't place a value on something that's free. Um, <laughs> what you need to pay for something, you know, that, that's yeah. what we say. Um, and therefore, you know, you're going to get, let's just say, a hundred people coming to a free course, and as soon as you put a value towards it, you're going to get twenty or ten. And those are the ones who are really the ones that wanted to really further themselves in the sport. Yeah. Um, what we look at is saying, listen, if we could get persons just to be knowledgeable about the sport and have them try at least to introduce it in their in their environment, then we're happy because for us, football, cricket, and athletics are our top three. That's what they look at. Hockey is not yeah. at the top three. But however, and I think it's because of competence. If we're not competent, then we're not confident to be able to actually coach um, yeah. the sport. So let's make you competent by giving you them some tools um, and therefore giving you the ability to now go out and, and you know, coach the yeah. sport for us. I think for the U.S., they have done a good job in having, and it's something that we are looking to also utilize, where we have, they have mobile coach, which gives them opportunity for coaches any part of the country to just log on and actually pull the sport and see what kind of skills they would do, what drills you could do, and again, at the lower level. So this, this, this gives competence to the coach, yeah. and it's something that's now become, you know, this online thing and everything else is so great that this is a good tool to have for a coach that says, you know what, I want you to introduce hockey into your school or into your environment. Yeah, just look at the app and you can actually carry through a full session or a full week, a, a month of, of, of training sessions that you don't need to plan. You know, just follow these things and understand it. I mean, agree that there are things that we need to have, um, you know, contact with and stuff like that. But I think it's great that I just also yeah. want to add one thing, if I can, Sarah, that even though with the online platform, and I know that um, Camilla touched on it and so did Craig, but there are different types of learners as we have at athletes. And not all players can actually sit on a website on, online for a length of period of time and understand, as opposed mm. to wanting a hands-on approach to it as well. So we also have to look at those players that have the different types of learning abilities. And therefore, that, that hands-on approach sometimes is better for some athletes, for them to actually learn better. So, yeah. you know, just wanting to that in as well. I mean, I, I guess that comes down to as a as a coach, knowing your players as well and knowing who's going to benefit from what type of coaching. And, you know, it's all about the individual athlete, isn't it? And, and getting the best from them. Um, the other point I was going to bring up from this discussion um, is the possibility of, of doing um, cross border, providing cross border coaching knowledge and sharing expertise. And I, I guess that's the nub of what this webinar is about. You know, we, we're here, we're sharing knowledge between at least four national associations here. Um, and we've, we've heard from Camilla that, you know, Argentinians go and, and, and coach over in Argentina. Um, we, we, we know that people move around, but how much scope is there for um, maybe people to pool resources or to, to, to have mentors from outside each, each national association? Is, is that something that you think um, people would be open to? Um, if you come to Laura first on that, would, would, would Argentina be prepared to share their, their knowledge, their experience and you know, their means of gaining success with other nations? Sorry, I don't 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 understand the question. Would you would you um, as a as a, a coach from Argentina be prepared to share your knowledge and your expertise with Chile, with Uruguay, with with those other nations, and 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 what sort of to what extent would you be prepared to do that? 
Um, I, I, I think um, here in Argentina uh, we have this situation that if you want to work in, in a school or in, in university, you have to study the career of physical education teacher and you can uh, coach in the school or in the university. But if you want to work in a club, you only could be a player without studying nothing and you could be a coach. So uh, this, uh, the, the situation that we have in, in Argentina that a lot of clubs have coaches that never study any courses, right. any coaching course, any career, nothing. So I, I think uh, that it is really important to prepare because you are going to be in front of people, uh, educating people. So it's important to prepare, to uh, pay courses. Uh, I think it's important that uh, courses uh, could be paid at least uh, something because you appreciate when you are paying your education. And uh, each year, uh, for example, in, in my personal situation, I uh, pay for uh, new courses or something. I don't know, mental preparation, anything, because I want to become better coach and better uh, in my knowledge. So I think that the preparation is really personal uh, if you want to keep growing in your care career as a coach. Yeah. Uh, would you be prepared, though, as a coach that's um, got plenty of qualifications, you've, you've, you've sort of gone through the coaching ladder, would you be prepared to share your knowledge with coaches from other countries? So if somebody from Chile contacted you and said, we need to um, improve the knowledge base of our female coaches. Is that something that you would be prepared to share with another, with another national association? Uh, in my personal experience, uh, uh, for the AFIH Academy and the Pan American Federation, I, really, I, I am prepared to share knowledge with other countries. But I think there are not a lot of coaches that are prepared but a lot of coaches, uh, if they offer a, a job, uh, maybe they go. But I don't know if they, they are really prepared. Yes, because it, it is uh, personal the education here in Argentina. Is you, you don't have a level one coaching course uh, nice. uh, obligatory to do for being a coach. So I think it's really, really important to um, make uh, online coaching courses, face-to-face -face coaching courses. And then uh, if there are someone of another country contact you, can uh, see your uh, CV and then and you've got, yeah. you decide, yes? Sure. Yeah, same question to you, Craig, really. I'm just sort of thinking um, about how possibly moving things forward in the future, that it might be possible to create mentorship schemes between a coach from one association that's doing female coaching, as an example, very well working alongside a country that perhaps needs some support in that in that area. Is, is that something that you think is, is possible across the continent or are there too many differences between nations? No, I think it's definitely possible. I think it happens. I think um, uh, all of us on the call, if we were thinking back over, but again, going over the past 12 months and what we've seen, what I've been incredibly impressed with is the openness of coaches to share. Uh, and that's not normal. That's, that's sort of evolved over the years. I used to be when I, you know, I've been in programs where it's sort of like protect everything <laughs> yeah. and show nothing, you know, and, and that's still, I'm sure that that happens. But um, I've, I've been involved in calls and I've been working with, look, look, fortunate enough to work with some of the, you know, the national coaches of, around the world in the last 12 months. And as I said, their willingness to share and their openness to share video or philosophies or pathway or structures is really impressive. And I've asked them the same question, do you, do you not mind, do you mind sharing this? And they're kind of like, well, no, this is what we do. This works for us. It's not necessarily going to work for you, but yeah, take what you work for you and plug it into your situation. And if it works, great. But I think a lot of this stuff, good coaching is not about just purely copying things. It's about observing something, taking the good stuff that might work for you and trying to incorporate that. And I think that's yeah. where, I mean, if, oh, geez, I, I watch soccer all the time and get, 90% of my stuff from soccer, you know, the, the, the idea of it, the, 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 the sort of nuance of it, and the, we have to then convert it to our sport because it's different, but you, I, you can take so much from everywhere and everything that I think good coaches or co coaches that are open to that 
um, will always take something. And I mean, who of any of us designed something unique? I mean, we, we, we sometimes do, but a lot of what we do is replicated from somewhere else or stolen or taken or borrowed. Yeah. And I think that that can only serve us well. And I think um, I've, as I've been really impressed with the, the openness of coaches and educators over the past 12 months. So it's, it's de- it happens. It, informally, it happens already. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Formally, I definitely think it can be something that we can look to, you know, across the, our region, for example, we can certainly work together and help each other. I saw an invite uh, from the Canadian um, Coaching Federation. It wasn't hockey specific, but it was just their National Association of Coaches inviting coaches from America to go and join their their coach education programs and that that sort of stuff it does happen and yeah we should advocate for more of it um I just want to come back to a point Camilla made because I think she she sort of spotted it really well was you know if in other industries we have to progress and we 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 take it seriously I'm a big advocate of that and I've my my life has been through coaching I've earned a career out of it and so for me, coaching is a profession, and I really I, I think it's important to distinguish that. There are pathway junior coaches that that they're just it's not it's not their lives, and and we try and provide opportunity to to manage that, and and so people can get in the gateway of the game, and that that we make that accessible as accessible as we can. But as we move up, and to Anthony's point, is that yeah, you you, you can't devalue the quality. Um, but I do think we can start to share and be open with what we're doing, certainly. Uh, fantastic. Um, Anthony, just coming back to a point that you made earlier, um, hockey isn't the biggest sport in Trinidad and Tobago. Do you um, talk to coaches from those other sports about, th- you know, is, is there a, a cross-sport sharing of knowledge as well? So it's not just from hockey to hockey, but, ho- you know, um, cricket to hockey and athletics to hockey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. I, I tend to do a lot of cross, you know, um, you know, that sharing of ideas. As Craig says, you know, I look at I look at football a lot, soccer a lot. I also look at basketball a lot. I mean, defensive, you know, structures and stuff like that. So you look at these things to see what you could grab from it. But yeah, I actually have um, I have rugby players that come to assist my my ladies in in, in footwork. I I have athletics coaches coming to teach proper running form, forms. You know. Um, so we try to always incorporate, you know, um, other sporting disciplines and share and let them understand that there's some some basis of everything. Running is running and we run. So yeah. therefore someone in athletics is a runner so we could utilize the, what they have, right? Um, and, and stuff like that. So, you know, we have these sports and disciplines here. Uh, what we try to do, and it might sound very nice, what we try to do is the ones that are unable to make national teams try to draw them towards us because they already have some yeah. capabilities from the prior sports that they would have been playing, whether it be soccer or whatever. We have a lot of soccer players now joining in hockey. And, you know, it's amazing to see their ability to adapt to the sport quickly. Um, I have a soccer defender that just wanted to learn how to go keep, and you put in in, in goal and you want to know where this energy came from. And the ability to close angles and stuff is already done because she was a defender, you know. Uh, So these are the little things that we look at. But, yeah, definitely... It's important, and I always share with the other coaches, you know, that that kind of ability. Some of the coaches actually want us to use us to actually work on hand-to-eye coordination because that's yeah. what we do, with, yeah. you know. So and I think it's, it's important, it's relative that we make that connection. But, yeah, and and we try to make that through other sports, and it, it really works out for us, some, you know, some nights. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I guess it's not just sport, is it? Because you can actually learn from... I mean, I was talking to someone the other day who had been to a business conference and took some of the um, the, the sort of behavioural messages from that business back into their sports team as well and, and vice versa. So, uh, yeah, the, the, where knowledge comes from is very important. Um, I wonder if um, each of you now, we've, I'm sort of really conscious that, that we're moving on with time a little bit, but uh, um, just identify where in your national association there are the biggest gaps in female coaches. So I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be towards the top, the top end. But just you, you know, if you just talk to me a little bit about where where you think the the gaps need to be addressed in a strategy that is going to improve equality across the sport. Um, so if we, if we, Laura, if we can come to you first, where where in the Argentinian coaching setup? Do you think there is the biggest lack of female coaches or female coaching opportunities? Yes, um, there are more uh, opportunities with uh, kids or uh, young girls or young boys. Yeah, uh, this is our reality. In first uh, division level, 
there are not a lot of opportunities <laughs> for women. And that's, is that largely because um, a mother will take her child to a hockey practice and because she keeps going, she'll get drawn into being involved and eventually she's just, she's just handed a whistle and told you are the coach. Is that how it happens? I, I think that um, there are a lot of uh, female coaches that could be in first uh, division level. But uh, in, in clubs, uh, they need to give them uh, opportunities because uh, they, well, all the head coaches or uh, the, all the, the, the staff, uh, they think that uh, women are better with kids, but it's not the reality. For example, in the, during the puberty, uh, there are a lot of uh, girls that uh, left the sports, different sports, not only hockey, and I think uh, one of the uh, could be that there is not a female coach to talk about what is happening in this uh, particular period of yeah. uh, young yeah. uh, girls that uh, are getting women. And if they have only a male coach, uh, maybe they can talk about this. Uh, so I, I think uh, they need to give them the opportunities. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, actually. Thank you for that. Um, Anthony, gaps, gaps in female coaches in Trinidad and Tobago? Yeah, I think that we, as you actually were saying, in the lower levels, we in the educational system, we have uh, our females there that are doing some work. But I think once we move out of that sector, there isn't much opportunities for, for persons. Um, I don't think they see the, the benefits, you know, mm. uh, if you look of, of it in the sense of monetary, there is no monetary benefit. Um, yeah in coaching at the other levels here we our club's not going to pay our coaches to coach um, and i think for us even though the some of our national players do end up coaching a coach at the lower levels and again it's because of you know being able to receive some sort of funding through fees or whatever that they assist any coaches with but mm. at the other level i don't think that it's there and the support isn't there for them um i I can speak for myself. I mean, I, I pay my way to do all my courses. I, I did get any support to say that you had that. Yeah. And I we need to, if we want to improve the sport and improve, um, you know, our coaching population in the in male or female, we need to at least have some way of support for them. Um, and that's not happening. So it's not a career driven for us in the, in the Caribbean. Yeah, it's not a career driven. It's more of a give back to the sport for what you have played for your life, more or less, yeah. stuff like that. So that. That reward isn't available in the Caribbean for, for our coaches at all. So there, so uh, it doesn't seem to be an action for women to get involved much. No, so it's, it also almost needs, needs a mindset change, doesn't it? You know, it's it's not a case of you have to give back to the sport. It's actually, you know, what, what you as a professional can give to the sport. Camilla, you've just gone on your side there a little bit. I don't know if you can flip back to the right way up. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you a slightly different question, Camilla. I was going to ask you what your experience of being coached by females is. At what level were you coached by a female? And when did the, when did the male coaches take over in your life? Um, when I was young, well, I had, I had uh, different coaches. I had male and female when I was younger. Um, I, but I think um, I actually had a lot of male <laughs> coaches <laughs> but I didn't really have that many female coaches um but I don't know for me it was it was fine that that idea and I I they were good coaches so I learned a lot from them yeah uh, if they would have been female or male it would have been okay for me um but in Chile we have lots of female coaches in in younger divisions because it's an opportunity for them as a player actually yeah. as a player of the first division you coach the younger kids, uh, you get some money, uh, a little bit of money, or you don't pay for what you have to pay in the club, yeah. things like that. So it's it's more of like um, um, helping out the, the club. And that's the way it, it works here in Chile. Um, and the salaries aren't that uh, convincing. So people <laughs> tend to go to other other places or other or in schools where sometimes you have a, a different schedule in different times because we train when you're in first division you train in the afternoons uh, late at night so uh, being a, a female coach in, in first division is a little bit hard when you are thinking about your family 
So mostly everybody tends to go to schools where you where you work uh, during the day. Yeah. Would you ever consider a career in coaching? Well, it's not my my my. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing that's a no. (laughs) I'll stay a player as long as I can. (laughs) Perfect, perfect. (laughs) Craig, would you give Camilla a job as a coach? (laughs) No, I'm joking. Um, (laughs) Gaps in gaps in coaching. I mean, you you seem to have got it pretty well covered in the US, but I'm from a female perspective. So, so you know, should should it be a case of you you're getting a few more guys in there? Um, Yeah. Firstly, Camilla, you're right. Keep playing as long as you can. Definitely keep that in mind. Um, yeah, in terms of where we're, yeah, I mean, our, 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 what our challenge is to increase our numbers of males across our sport, whether it's players, coaches, educators, um, and we've got, you know, we, we continue to work on that and we've got um, some great initiatives around that, but it's, that, that definitely is a work in progress for us. But I think, I, I would agree, I think our higher performance end is where we continue to try and, you know, provide opportunities for female coaching. Um, we, we are able to use some of the role models. I just saw as a, a, in the chat there, there's a question from Hannah there, you know, if there's no role models, how can we sort of, where do we start? And we, we are able to find role models. We've got some fantastic former players, as I said, going back many, many years that have been coaching. And if I look at our junior programs now, we, we, we're quite strategic in how we try and appoint coaches. They have to be qualified and they have to bring something to the to the table. They they can't just they're not just sort of nominated and put in. But we've got players like I'm mean, just in the group now, Rachel Dawson is a former player who's working with our junior teams. We've got Katie Bam, we've got Melissa Gonzalez, you know, the list goes on. There's a, a huge group of, you know, well known, iconic American players mm. that have given back and are back in the sport. And that's fantastic for us. And I think the idea of advocacy is important, and I think mentorship, advocacy, whatever you want to call it, I, I, don't, I don't think that is necessarily mutually exclusive for female to female. I think you can have male advocates that can advocate for female coaches and mentor female coaches, and I think that's a good place to start is don't necessarily feel we have to see, you know, somebody like, I'm, I've, you know, Sarah, I've been very fortunate to work in coaching staffs with female coaches, and I think they bring so much to any staff. And Karen Brown is an example of somebody that when I was with GB, absolutely integral to that staff when I was there and, and subsequently in the Olympic gold medal team. So, so important in their role and, and critical, I think, when working with female teams is that mm-hmm. you, you can have that ear. And and, be, and I, I still think, you know, male coaches, coaching females, it's absolutely not a problem. But I do feel you need to sort of, yeah, they really need to be attuned to listen and, and hearing what's being said. Or, you know, you, you, what I tend to do is try and put people, women around me and say, right, well, help me out with this. And you know, <laughs> what's actually being said here, you know, so, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a question I'm just sort of throwing in here a little bit, really, just based on a few things that have been said. Um, do we think, as a, as a collective panel, I mean, do, do we think that female coaches and male coaches do bring different qualities I mean should there be not just a blended approach to learning but should there be a blended approach to coaching a team as well do it does a team benefit from having a female on the coaching staff as well as a male to deal with exactly the sort of things that Laura was talking about you know actually understanding what a female is going through at any particular point in her life um, a different intuition um, are there are there different qualities so if we go around I'll, I'll come to Anthony's nodding the most so I'm going to go to Anthony first yeah, I, I kind of understand that because I am my, I'm the male coach and I'm surrounded by women. Manager is a woman, assistant coach is a woman, <laughs> um, assistant manager is a woman. So <laughs> I kind of understand. <laughs> I kind you, of you understand. Couldn't, you that. couldn't do anything but nod, could you really? <laughs> <laughs> but I do understand, Craig. You know, because there's so much that we know and there's so much that I keep learning um, with with you know having them around me and understanding. Uh, what's happening sometimes, sometimes you know, they, they bring me back in line. So, yeah, I kind of think it's important that we have that, as well as a learner exchange. So it's an exchange of, of that. Um, and I think that is what had encouraged one, my assistant coach to actually take a male team and decided that she felt confident to be with the coach and male team and just the exchange of knowledge and stuff like that. So 
you know, I wish I could have more females doing the same thing and just going out there and coaching. Um, and not just looking at it on the development level to make out, make money, you mm -hmm. know, but actually see it as a career of sharing knowledge and sharing the information learned. Um, you know, and I think that's a, that's a key thing to have uh, both male and females, even the athletes respecting both genders. Yeah. Whether it be a male team having a female coach or a male or female team having a male coach and still having that respect and understanding that knowledge that they have um, is, is crucial to be able to create performance. You know, um, and that's something that uh, it might be a single battle in my country that I try to do, um, but it is what it is here. Um, and I try my best to still educate um, athletes and coaches to be able to go out there and have the confidence to be able to coach uh, in that manner. Yeah, fantastic. Laura, how do you feel about it? Do you, do you feel that a team can benefit from having a blend of a male and a female coaching staff? Um. Yes, I have a, an experience as coach of the under-18 uh, national uh, team for the youth uh, yeah. with uh, girls yeah. and boys. I was part of the staff coaching uh, and was really a good uh, opportunity to work with total freedom and always with communication with uh, all the other coaches. And we were uh, two women and eight men. <laughs> and what happened to me is that uh, the the girls, that the, the woman, a uh, lot of time uh, came to me to ask me things if they feel felt bad or, or something, but uh, not a lot uh, boys. Boys prefer to talk with the men coaches. That was my experience. That was your experience. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, Craig, what's your feeling? Um, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, again, I think we could all list off a a list of names of successful men that have been successful with women's teams and you know it's probably probably trickier to do it with female coaches but I, I think there are certain um, nuances in relationships or different cultures wherever it may be and I think that's an important part culturally it's important to see understand a, a nation's culture as to you know how it's how it works but um, yeah I, I'm yeah I'm a big advocate for um, you know, getting the best coach in position, regardless of what they are um, gender-wise. But um, in terms of, I think I, I've had fantastic experiences of working with female coaches, and I've seen the benefit of it at high performance. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's, it's to be encouraged, of course. Yeah. Yeah, um, Camilla. Again, as a player, if you had a a problem that you wanted to talk about, be it about selection or be it about a playing thing, would would you prefer to talk to a female coach or does it not matter to you at all? It, I think it, yeah, I think we we would go to the to the female, but but then as Craig said, you have different kinds of coaches. Um, it doesn't sometimes it doesn't really matter the gender. Uh, it it matters how you connect to that person. Yeah beyond their their gender so in in my experience throughout my my career and my hockey career i mean i've had many kinds of uh um coaches strict coaches more relaxed uh, female male and i think that's been very good for me like to see different yeah. kinds of coaches that's been really uh, you can learn from someone this you can learn from the other that and that's, I think, in the end, when you have a, a coaching team, it's important you have different kinds of people that think differently and not all like the same, thinking the same and talking the same thing all the time. So I think in the end, if it's a female or if it's a male, it it matter. shouldn't matter that much, but it should matter um, how they think, how they talk, how they express themselves, how they connect to the, to the, to the, to uh, the, Got my yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> so, so, so really, I mean, that actually all comes down to a the, the the person's personality, but also maybe the coach learning and development program they've been through to get them into a situation where they are getting the best out of their players, and that that's why it's important that females do these courses as much as men. Um, I'm very conscious that a with time is moving on and we might have one or two questions at the end so um what i'd like to do is just um move to the fifth point on the list i sent you which is talk about some of the solutions that you think might address gender equality within 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 coaching um so not necessarily what would work in your own country but based on the discussion we've had 
what do you think might be, um, I'm going to say a panacea, although that's obviously uh, um, a difficult one to achieve, but what, what do you think might be a solution that maybe a, a nation can take from what, either what we've spoken about or, or your own thoughts on the matter? What, what would you like to see change, alter, develop, um, be created that, that would just change the situation? Um, I'm waffling, just to give you time to think about that. Uh, so I'll come to um, Craig first. Um, yeah, I think we've, we've spoken about the online component uh, several times on this call. I think that certainly provides accessibility for, for coaches um, and, and that, that's a great mechanism. Um, one of the things we started to, we introduced it a couple of years ago after one of our coaches forums was we had a specific Women in Coaching's Day, which is only accessible, only accessible for women coaches. And they had their own sort of program and there was a real kinship developed and there was a real community sense that they really got in, you know, empowered and to sort of come together as a group. And that was the start of that journey and that sort of just moved along each year. And this year in the spring, we will continue that journey and we will, it was important for us to have, you know, this sort of um, just a women's only space to, to kick this off so they could really just start to, understand coaching and their terms and, and sort of set the boundaries and parameters for how they wanted to operate and and then we've sort of moved it along and this year we'll be working to have a this this idea of trying to introduce male advocacy and um, using mentorship to to try and accelerate and help um, women through their coaching careers and, and one of the things that we see in industry and, and we can learn it for our own sports is that you know, it's more it's more difficult for females to have the conversation around, I don't know, for salary, for example. Mm -hmm. it, it, it sometimes can be difficult to manage up and, and the conversation is not as easy to have. Whereas if you've got a, a male advocate or mentor, then they can help and, and try and support some of those conversations or difficulties or challenges that um, sometimes we see female executives have, for example. So that's one of the things that we've been working on. and and. I wouldn't say, you know, we, we're still developing it, we're still working it through, but um, the, the feedback has been really good and we yep. will continue to try and to, to push that as an initiative. So, um, again, we haven't finalised the dates for that, but that, again, with, with online experience, that could be an opportunity for people on this call to, to come and join with that. Fantastic. And that actually answers the question, or partially answers the question from Nicole Newman. Has anyone had experience in running female-only coaching opportunities? So thank you for that. Um, and, and that's definitely an actionable um, point. Um, Camilla, same question to you. What, what do you think might be a, a solution um, for gender equality? Um, as I see it here in, in Chile, I think we um, something very important is like a, a lack of the role models and mm -hmm. seeing that somebody has done it before. Uh, it's very important for, for somebody else that wants to do it. And there aren't that many people um, who just um, go and do what they want, even though nobody's ever done it before. So um, like to get incentives throughout our federations or national associations, to to help those women um, get to higher levels and to show everybody else that it's possible that um, hopefully the salaries are are good enough for what you studied what you learned and everything and they they pay you back what you what you need to earn so I think it, there's a, a lot of that part of the role models that's important like to see um, um, examples internationally that you see women coaching national teams that you see them in high level um hockey and and then you go see you go seeing that it's possible and that more people will follow yeah absolutely just uh, uh, just hopping back one point um within within chile itself in other sports do you see many female coaches i mean are there role models no you don't <laughs> no, so this could no, this could no, be a case no, of hockey no. leading the way in, in chile maybe one day that would be, yeah that would be awesome <laughs> Um, Laura, for, for yourself, what, what do you think could be a workable solution, either in Argentina or across parts of the PATH region? Yes, um, uh, last week I was uh, reading a research about a salary, the best uh, female coaches paid in the world uh, are the 
uh, I think 10 or 12 percent the salary of the best male coaches pay in the world. So I think the, the first thing uh, should be the, the equality in the salary is, yep. is, is, uh, and the equality in the opportunity to, be, to give the opportunity uh, of uh, women coaches to coach uh, first divisions, uh, women or men's, uh, but to, to give this opportunity. And then for education, I think uh, every local federation uh, offer courses, coaching courses, to men, women, to all, all of them, so they have uh, more knowledge uh, when they arrive to coaching uh, teams. Um, obviously, Argentina is very different to the USA, but could you see the benefit of female-only coaching courses? Can you see that that would offer, as Craig said, a safe space where females might, might feel that they can expand their coaching knowledge a bit more? I think uh, the coaching courses, um, male and female, it should be 50-50 uh, for me, uh, not, not uh, all women or all men, because uh, if uh, all are different coaches, all mm -hmm. have the baggage, the experience, and you can learn uh, uh, of the other coach. So I think uh, they should be both of them, uh, men and women. Brilliant. Anthony, solutions coming from Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, um, I see it as, you know, there's something that I'm thinking of that would like to see happen. Um, even though we're trying to create a coaches association um, with our coaches, not necessarily only in hockey, but also in, um, in the essence of all sports. And if it is that we could create a forum for both um, a male forum and a female forum, and then a general forum where they could actually, you know, interview with themselves at that point, I think. Oh, he's frozen. <laughs> Anthony, are you coming back to us? Okay. Uh, you hear me? We can hear you now. Carry on. Sorry. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, to, to actually do that, we're also looking at also having a manner of where we could have awareness done so that awareness of females could actually survive in um you know coaching and still being a mother and still being a parent and still yeah. doing to work um i think that's a big thing that we should be be focusing on as well and maybe just teaching and educating how that is a possibility maybe with persons who are already doing it so persons like laura who are already doing it and actually teaching university coaching and as well continuing through their life as usual what is yeah. the process of doing that how do we do that what do we do if pregnancy happens? And, and how do I still go through that life, still wanting to, to do what, what is necessary? Um, and I think we need to make people aware of this prior to it actually happening and therefore understand that there is a process and there are people that could support you in that manner, um, you know, where that is concerned. You know, uh, and I think that that's a key thing that, that that awareness, we need to bring in the Caribbean that there is a life of coaching for our females, even though they are the breadwinner, you know, are, household and, and seeing our family and working and, and, you know, different things that are happening. Um, yeah. And I think also educating our males to understand that there is that ability that we need to share. It's not just, you know, that that old thinking of the woman, see about the woman. I don't believe in that kind of thing. I think that we have changed that mindset yeah. and we should be able to understand how to share that responsibility as I think Camilla and Laura was talking about. So I think that's important as well. So awareness for me in the Caribbean about how we can survive as coaches and still have an you know that that, that that light yeah. yeah so we need to um from here from this point on we need to rent laura out as the role model that everybody can look up to because she's doing it is that okay laura we're going to rent you out sorry can you repeat the question <laughs> yeah no, i was i was joking i said we're going to rent you out as a role model you're going oh, to be... Okay, okay. <laughs> um, that's that's absolutely fantastic, everybody. Um, all, to all the panelists, there. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'd I'd made a little list as we were talking of um, of steps that possibly would be generic across the PAF region, and uh, um, you, you you basically all of you have, have covered all of those things. Um, maybe start with a women's only coaching group where there's where there's safety, but then 
male advocacy on top of that and then quickly get into the 50-50 split that Laura was talking about, um, making sure that your coaches have got the correct characteristics, the correct um, training, um, the correct learning, so that it doesn't actually matter if it's male or female. They are just coaches who are respected as professionals. Um, we talked about blended learning using online as well as face-to-face. -face, and we've talked about the importance of role models. And we've talked about the um, the importance of, of, of raising awareness of, of issues and uh, that, that female coaches will face and dealing with them. So um, I'm going to hand back to Mary um, with almost impeccable timing. We've got four minutes, Mary, to wrap up. I don't know if anybody um, has got any questions, but I would just, all I would like to say is I think there's some great things have come out from there. I'd like to thank the panellists for being um, absolutely great tonight. Yeah, and on behalf of PATH, I want to thank all our panellists who all were sort of hand-selected, as I always say, voluntold. Um, <laughs> I thank you for your time and energy. Sarah, as always, you did a wonderful job maneuvering everyone to getting <laughs> Actually, I think just the list that you provided, I think, Marika, you've got a number of new webinars that you can host that may can go that maybe go to the other continental federations that they can build on. On my personally for me and on behalf of the PATH organization, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, it was it was wonderful to hear all the stories and actually it was interesting to hear how many of the topics you talk about is so similar in whatever country you're in so that we're not all diverse as diverse as people think in when we come to women in coaching. So thank you. Marika, over to you for the last goodbye. You need to unmute. Just unmute, Marika. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much to, to Sarah, of course, but also thank you very much to the panelists. I've listened to you with open ears and very good contribution. And it's interesting to see if we go to the other continents where for sure there also will be a subject female coaching, if we can compare the different continents. And it's our plan to come at a certain moment at the end of the year with an overall outcome of all the uh, continental webinars. And I hope it will bring all of you a step further and that in your continent you will have more equality uh, men women thank you so much for this contribution great thank you yeah thanks everyone thank Brian, you very much you? to you um if i can just add something Tuli, of course uh so if you still have question after this webinar do not hesitate to send an email to Valerie. I've put her name and email address on the chat. She will be happy to to respond to you guys. So thank you again. It was a fantastic webinar. So stay safe and see you soon. Yeah. OK, bye. Bye, bye. bye everyone. Bye bye. Bye, Coco. Bye. Bye. Goodbye, thank you.